Vision for Life is a ministry of Fellowship Denver Church that takes place in two expressions. One is periodic in-person classes that are held at Fellowship Denver Church in Denver, Colorado. The second is a weekly podcast. I'm Autumn, the host of the Vision for Life podcast. You're listening to part three of a three-part class on the topic of understanding abortion taught by Pastor Dave Moreland. Well, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you uh, all for being here. I'm going to pray for us, and then I'll frame up the evening. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for each person here who desires to follow you, to be faithful disciples of Jesus, and to uh, follow you in the midst of a complex world and in really complicated issues. So I thank you for the courage every every person here has to to want to uh, go to a teaching series and a forum uh, that's addressing Uh, perhaps the most uh, contentious uh, issue of our day. Um, So I thank you for everyone here. God, I pray your spirit would be with us tonight uh, to show us your truth, to show us to the gospel, to give compassion, and also to uh, further uh, deepen our understanding of of life and, and how valuable it is that you make it. So, God, I I pray that you would teach us all of these things uh, tonight and grow our capacity to understand and to learn. So I pray you'd speak and use each of our panelists in a really meaningful way and that you would empower them to say uh, what it is that we need to hear to be more faithful followers of you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, tonight is the uh, final night of our VFL series understanding abortion, and we've said that VFL, Vision for Life, is a teaching series that's really designed to help disciples of Jesus navigate how to follow Jesus in really complex societal issues. So we've talked about sexuality, we've talked about politics, we've gone through issues of racism, mental health, um, all these topics in the past. And, and so this topic of abortion, though, is perhaps the most probably contentious of all of these. So um, we've said that many of us, especially those of us who have grown up in the church, have been told what to think about abortion. Many of us haven't been taught how to think about it. How do disciples actually think and engage about this issue of abortion? So part of what we've wanted to do the past few weeks is to think deeply as disciples, historically, philosophically, what are the presuppositions at play with abortion? And then last week, biblically, theologically, what does God have to say about the practice of abortion? How are we to respond? What's a faithful response of, to abortion by disciples of Jesus? And what does scripture kind of teach us about that? So that's kind of what we, where we've been the past couple of weeks. What we haven't dealt with is the more practical, now what? I'm a Christian. I want to be faithful to Jesus. Um, How do I do do my part to support women who are actually faced with an unplanned pregnancy? How do I do, what, what, what part do I play in that? So we haven't talked a lot about the practical sort of ramifications of the theology of Imago Dei. So... What tonight really is all about is we have four incredible panelists, each of whom have significant expertise in various aspects with this issue. And I'm going to let them sort of introduce themselves here in just a minute. But my hope for tonight is to help each one of you think, what's my next step? Vision for Life is not about just understanding things. We're not oranges on a stick. We're not brains on a stick. Um, uh, We're whole people. Orange on a stick. Um, Brain on a stick. We're not just heads. Um, We're whole people. And so I, I want you to think not just what should I think about abortion, but what's sort of the next step for me? How do I begin to integrate this truth more into my life? And I want you to have that question as we engage with the panelists. 
Something that is just a, a reality for me, at least, in pastoral ministry, is that um, I've, I've mentioned this the first night, that over the course of 17 years of being a pastor, I've, I've been in the, a really sensitive position um, helping women over the years face this very situation. What do I do in this situation with an unplanned pregnancy? It's always difficult. It's always complicated. What is notable, however, is that I've never had someone who's been considering abortion in the context of of my world who hasn't been pro-life. They've all been pro-life. They've all would have gone to the part one and part two of this vision for life and be like, yeah. But when faced with the practicality practical reality of an unplanned pregnancy, the overwhelming reality of the drastic change their life is going to take if they take this baby to term, then it gets real. It hasn't been an an issue of knowledge. For many people in our context, it's an issue of resource, of community, of friendship, of trust? Is this the kind of place I can trust to help me, support me for the next nine months, year, two years, 10 years, or not? So, so for me, when I think about abortion, it's, it's often, in our context of our church, it's often not people don't know better. Um, I think the national statistics kind of bear this out as well. Um, It's that people don't know or don't believe they actually have a community that can help them in that season. So um, this is why tonight is so important, because the people who will be on this panel help to create in different ways this sort of thickness of community that actually helps to reduce abortions in our community. Um, that preserves and protects the Imago Dei through the various work that these people are doing and participating in. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, So panelists, go ahead and come on uh, behind me here. Uh, I'm going to have them just introduce themselves. And uh, Linda, uh, we'll just start with you. And I'm just going to have them introduce themselves and then after that, I've, I've given each of them 10 minutes to kind of give their spiel, um, their kind of heartbeat, their, their, their passion sort of behind what it is that they do, what they've done. So anyway, Linda, take, take it away. Great. Yeah. Thanks for having me here tonight. My name is Linda Sacamano, and I am the executive director at Alternatives Pregnancy Center. And I've been with the organization for 10 years and as the executive director for the last three and a half. And it's been a real honor and privilege for me. I'm Becky Brayman, and I go to fellowship here. And I am a volunteer with Safe Families and also a foster parent and adoptive parent. I'm Natasha Smith. I am a co-author of the book Unplanned Grace, which is a compassionate conversation on life and choice, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Hey, my name is Blake Burgett, and uh, I'm a pastor here in the Denver area at uh, Calvary West Littleton, um, and I'm also a PhD student, and my uh, dissertation is on Christian ethics and abortion. All right. Thank you guys, each of you, for being here, and... Um, Linda, let's just start with you. Um, uh, Tell us about your involvement with alternatives and tell us what you think we all need to know. Oh, my. (laughs) So in 10 minutes. That's a little heavy. (laughs) In 10 minutes. Well, I guess what I'd like to say to to this group is to really uh, understand that the pro-life movement is a spectrum. As any other movement, there's people that are on 
all the way across the spectrum, right? And so to label it, I, I really don't love the labels pro-life and pro-choice because there are different pieces of it that we all might feel differently about. And like Dave already mentioned, if a woman who is even, let's say she's pro-choice and yet she thinks she only has one choice and that's abortion, where is the pro-choice in that, right? If we're not providing enough resources for her where she feels like she doesn't have to make that choice if she doesn't want to, then it really is no choice. And the same with a pro-life woman. How can we help her if she says, I really don't want to make this choice, but I feel like it is my only choice. So that's where you'll find alternatives on the pro-life spectrum is in that point of human intersection and uh, where we come alongside women and men because for every unplanned pregnancy there's a man involved somewhere so it for me it's great to see the guys here um, and and we walk alongside them through the journey and we work on uh, seven fundamentals as an organization um, and one of those is we're ministers but we're not manipulators and so we we if we can, if you guys can help us, we need to shed the myth of pregnancy center work because we are not manipulating women into, you know, now the social media thing is we're forced birthers or something like that. that that's not true. I mean, and I would invite all of you, I guess I'll jump to a quick call to action and then go backwards a little bit, is to come and see for yourselves. Take a tour of one of our clinics. We have four clinics across the Denver metro area, one here in downtown Denver, uh, one in Lakewood, one in... Uh, Aurora, and then one in the Inverness Business Park area. It's Inglewood, but kind of I-25 and County Line. And so we're serving across the Denver metro area. We've been doing it for 40 years. We have served over 100,000 teens, women, and men. We work with two strategies and four programs. So the strategies, the first one is the prevention and we are out in public schools, private schools, with a program called A Promising Future, because if uh, somebody downstream, I saw this on social media, so I'm going to try and use it, somebody downstream has fallen into the river, why don't we do something up the river to keep them from falling in? And so it's like the teens, why are they making some of the choices that they're making, and how can we educate them on they're more than their sexual choices, um, and how do they make good decisions that are self-honoring to their value system that will keep them from coming into one of our pregnancy centers down the road. Um, and then the intervention is our core programming, which is the pregnancy options. We have licensed professional counselor. We work under her license. Um, we have, um, so we do counseling model where we're building relationship. We are good listeners. We're asking good questions. They're trauma-informed caregivers. And we are helping the woman sitting in that sacred place with us uh, understand the complexity of our circumstances because everyone's is different and unique um, and then talk about all three pregnancy options so another myth is you know that we only that we're forcing the birth that I already talked about or we are only talking about parenting we do educate on all three pregnancy options so it's uh, what does it look like if you are going to parent what does your support network look like and how can we help with that if you're have you considered an adoption plan? What does that look like? Could we get you connected with a licensed agency, a caseworker? Or if you want to have an abortion, if that's the way you're leaning, what do you know about abortion? What do you know about what's going to happen with your body? And so we have medically accurate education on all three of those uh, pregnancy options. And we invite her for an ultrasound so that she can see for herself what's going on in her own body. And um, we invite him into the process if she wants to have him in the process, we will see him outside of what she wants because he also deserves a safe place to process his feelings. And so uh, we offer that to him outside of, of her wishes, kind of. I mean, that sounds a little weird, but if he comes in with her, we offer him a place to be seen. Yeah, that's a better way to say it. And it's with a male client advocate. And then if she does want to invite him into the ultrasound room, then that's when we invite him into the conversation with her. So it's very safe. It's very client-led. We have permission-based care. 
Um, and then we identify what resources that she would need going forward. We help her get connected to prenatal care if that's what she wants to do. We have a network of doctors in our medical resource guide. Uh, we have a lot of material resources, and uh, then we stay in touch with her throughout the journey of her pregnancy. Should she choose to have an abortion, we have a licensed professional counselor on staff that does counseling after abortion. She does grief and loss work. Uh, people experience that differently, and so so we're there to help them walk through that uh, and we we want to address all dimensions of their health and Dave mentioned this too it's not just we're not just heads right we have our, our dimensions are we have to meet the physical need but then what about the emotional the mental health we've all heard about the mental health crisis uh, the spiritual the social needs so we address the whole person and we want her to be uh, the person that God's called her to be and not live in some guilt or shame ridden uh, life because the secret is what holds the power. So uh, those, those are our programming strategies and um, it's very robust. We have a 24 hour helpline. Uh, there's just a lot of things that we offer. So tonight I brought some things that if you're interested and would like to take some resources with you, this one is uh, ways to take action and there's different volunteer positions if you wanted to get involved. Um, and then this is our 2021 annual report more information about our programming and uh, all of that. So uh, they're over here and you're welcome to take one with you. So that's my spiel. And I hope I did it in 10 minutes. Yeah. I didn't time my Good. So they're each going to go and share. Afterwards, we're going to have extended minutes. I don't know if that clear. So I know I already have a couple of questions for the up. I hope that you do too. Um, so I'm mostly here kind of as a representative for Safe Families, which is an organization that works to support vulnerable families um, and with an emphasis on family preservation. And so there's a huge variety of reasons why people are referred, um, but it's really the goal is to divert kiddos from foster care, which is a pretty ugly system and a good thing to avoid if you can. Um, and so there's different roles involved, partly because of the different reasons why people are referred. Um, but you can be a host family and watch kiddos for a couple nights or a couple months. You can help with during the day things. You can bring families to appointments. Um, and I think where it intersects with abortion is just that if you choose to carry a child to term, it's a lifelong process. It doesn't end after nine months when the baby's healthy and you go home. It doesn't end when you, they're out of diapers and you don't need free diapers anymore. It's like you have to care for them forever. And I mean, hopefully they like graduate high school and move on, but you're always a mom, right? And um, these, like they're just such complex situations that um, it's, I think, a really incredibly brave thing for some of these women to carry their children to term. And um, they have to make ends meet and they have to figure out a way to go to work and they have to find a place for their child to live and a way to care for them. And so many women don't have any sort of support system, like they call it social poverty. But one of the reasons why people are referred is that maybe mom like has a medical event and she has to go to the hospital and there is zero people that she can take with her or to take the, her children. And so like women show up to the hospital with their kids, even if like if they're giving birth, because there's nobody that they have that they can trust to take their kid. Um, and there's been kids in our city that have gone into foster care because of that, that were referred to state families that didn't have enough volunteers. I was out of town. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, it's just, it's really, really complex and they need people to watch their kids, they need people to tell them that they're, doing it well and they need people to show walk alongside them with parenting and show them what it's like to be a responsive parent and to love your kids well um, because a lot of these women have not don't have any confidence and they don't don't like they've never been taught that um, so I think I don't know I could go on for like a really long time but that's kind of safe families in a nutshell it's okay. just pretty complicated Can you describe some, I mean, you're a mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, 
So the first kiddo I had was on Thanksgiving Day. She came to our house. Um, she was eight. Her little brother was in the hospital with RSV, and she was not allowed to stay at the hospital with them, with mom. So mom had to choose if she would stay with the two-year-old or what she would do with the eight-year-old. Um, so she stayed with us, and then I visited her again when the baby was born and got to hold him in the NICU and um, had like long hour and a half long phone conversations with her um, just so that she had somebody that she could process her trauma with. Um, there's a little guy, mom just got promoted, so she might not be working on the weekends, but he's been here every week for the last eight weeks on Sunday morning, and he gets to go into the Curious Koalas and learn about Jesus, and he has learned so much from our house and our kids, and mom has finally has a stable job. She's living in transitional housing, and so now when she moves, she has a job, and she can save, and I think... Um, yeah, there's and then two other little boys we had. Um, it was just a required training, and mom has nobody to watch them. So they come, and they eat chicken nuggets with us, and they sleep on our boys' floor. And it's, I think, not as scary, too, as some people think. I think people assume that these kids have trauma, and they're going to be terrible to watch, and it's going to be a nightmare. Um, but they're little kids, and they need love, and their moms need love, and the dads need love if they're involved, and it's just complicated. So... Um, it's really just to walk alongside them and be the support system that we all need and that they don't have. Yeah, so I spent about five years being able to visit pregnancy centers all over the country from Alaska to New York to California. And um, as I was doing that, first of all, anytime I'd meet someone within the pro-life world, I just would think like this is a giant of faith. The, the work that they do, the sincerity of their hearts, their willingness to sacrifice so much in a very hard way world, you know, and it's selfless, such selfless ministry. And so um, it was a real privilege to meet people who, um, you know, were just present, present for people and solution, you know, thinking solutions mindedly, you know, of how can we help this individual, you know, overcome the circumstances that they might be involved in right now. And it's hard and it's complex, like you've <laughs> alluded to. There's just so much nuance in this conversation. And so also for a few years, I was able to do some video production and do some documentaries on late-term abortion and men's ministry at pregnancy centers and um, tell stories of women who thought they had no other choice and then what it was that changed their mind. And so many of those women that I met, I ended up uh, co-authoring a book and telling those stories because there, there's a lot of confusion. You know, I heard people within the church say, I can't imagine why anyone would ever do this. And then I sat across from women who stories were so complex and like, I get why you feel like there was no other option. Um, but what's amazing within that is how pregnancy centers find solutions and support and truly empower women to overcome whatever it is that they might be facing or are present for them after they've made a decision and feel that pain. And they can still come and find a home and receive love and care. And that's just incredible work. Uh, so, so I'm Playing Grace tells the stories of really the, the three themes that I saw as, as um, kind of undergirding the, the reasons why women choose abortion. The biggest one is economics. So 73% of women choose abortion because they feel like they can't afford it for whether it's housing or homelessness or jobs. Uh, and that's very, very real. And what an amazing place for the church to step in. And, you know, that that's the solution that we could offer. And pregnancy centers will help women, you know, navigate the options that might be in, available in their local community. Um, and so the other was relationships because relationships are, you know, scary. The thought of losing someone that you really care about or the pressures from family, friends, or your partner, uh, are very, very difficult. Um, and especially if there's abuse involved. And, and so what I was seeing through this is like the mama's heart is, is there, you know, all through this, of the fear of not being able to provide enough or the fear of not being able to pr provide a safe home. Um, and then the third uh, part of the book was about health, you know, and, and wanting to provide, you know, 
a healthy life for their child. And so like all of these things, you see like there's a mama's heart there that's in a lot of pain. And um, my co-author did an amazing job of, of with e within each category, what are the organizations nationally that provide a solution for each one of those things? So it can kind of serve as an index of, you know, if, if someone's ho homeless or facing an abusive situation, where do we start? Where, how can we find a solution there? And there's uh, incredible, incredible options. But our first call to action is always like, connect to your local pregnancy center, because they know what is um, available locally. And we actually also featured Safe Families because it's such a cool um, option that, that really cares for the mothers well. Because within this whole conversation, it's, it's as if like moms and children have been pitted against each other. And we wanted to provide a, um, a middle road of saying like, okay, we can actually all agree that women should be cared for. And so who is caring for women mo most holistically? And um, I've just seen such incredible work that pro-lifers are doing, whether or not she chooses life. Like, they're a present for her no matter what. Um, and, and for the fathers, too. And uh, it's just remarkable work uh, to see. And, and it's such a nuanced conversation that I think when we, when we can find that middle ground of saying, okay, we all agree that, that women matter, then we can help them create the margin needed to realize that they have value their unborn children have value, that, that change changes their lives and it changes our culture as well. All right. I'm a pastor, and uh, so I'm going to stand up. So I appreciate your grace if I get really animated because this is also something that um, my family and I are very passionate about. Um, so I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm also... Um, an academic student, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, and this is this is my focus. And so, um, uh, one of the things that I would like to do with my research is actually mobilize the church um, in getting involved. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to come and to be able to share with you all. And so I just kind of want to start with that, and then I want to give you some practical ways. Um, of how you can get involved wh where, wherever you're at. And so why should you even care about abortion? Um, why should you care about the unborn? Why, she, why should you care about a woman who's experiencing crisis pregnancy? Um, well, uh, the reason I believe you should care is, first and foremost, well, I'm a, uh, first of all, I'm assuming that the unborn are human beings, and I uh, would assume that most of you here actually believe that, that, that you agree with that. And, and the reason I assume that is because most uh, pro-abortion advocates actually believe that as well. They kind of grant that. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, the, uh, medical the medical community, over 95% actually believe that a human being comes into existence at the moment of fertilization. 95% of embryologists, biologists, and scientists who... Uh, deal with the beginning of human life in their field. So I'm assuming that, and, I, and, and there are reasons for that. So, um, so if the unborn are in fact human beings, and abortion is the intentional taking of that human life, and that's an uncontroversial statement, I don't know any pro-abortion advocate who would actually deny that statement, um, then Abortion is by far the most significant human rights issue in the history of the world. Now that's, I understand that's a really audacious claim to say that abortion is the most significant human rights issue in the history of the world, but let me just kind of explain why I believe that. So according to the Guttmacher Institute, um, which is the research arm of Planned Parenthood, and according to the World Health Organization, there are an estimated 73 million abortions that happen every single year worldwide. 73 million. So over the past 30 years, that ends up being one point, over 1.5 billion abortions that have happened worldwide. So that's 200,000 abortions every single day worldwide, 200,000. I grew up in a town of less than 100,000. 
Um, I'm sure some of you grew up in towns that were less than 200,000. Just imagine that. So that's, those are the numbers. And just to put that into perspective, um, according to research that was done by the World Health Organization in 2015, these are the most recent numbers that I could find, is that you have 55 million people who die from every single cause of death on the planet per year. So 55 million people are dying every year, roughly, um, from every cause of death. So that means that we are aborting more human beings than born people are dying from every cause on the planet. So that includes everything from natural death to disease to war to traffic accidents to addictions and whatever you could think of. So if those numbers are accurate, and I have no reason to believe why they wouldn't be accurate, I've looked at the uh, the way that they've conducted their research, and it's impeccable. So those numbers look accurate to me. 73 million abortions, 1.5 billion abortions in the past 30 years. Then that means that more human beings have been killed through abortion than any other cause in the history of the world. So that's why I would say that abortion is the most significant human rights issue in the history of the world. And as Christians, you are called, you are commanded by our Lord Jesus and the rest of the scriptures to stand up for the oppressed, to be a voice for the voiceless, to care for and protect the vulnerable. That's what you're commanded to do. In fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, he tells us that one of the marks, one of the defining marks of a believer is how they care for the oppressed and the voiceless. So you are commanded to do this. You're commanded to care for the least of these, and I would most certainly include the unborn and women in crisis pregnancy in that category. So that's why I think you should care about abortion. That's why I think you should get involved as, as a Christian. Now, uh, so what are some ways that you can do that? And we'll definitely get some uh, questions um, up here in just a little bit, but again, since I'm a pastor, I'm going to give you an alliteration uh, because that's what pastors do sometimes. And so I'd say there are three main categories of ways that I would encourage you to get involved, and that's assistance, awareness, and advocacy. So assistance, we just just think about your time, your talent, and your treasure. How can I assist in the in the pro-life cause? Um, so how can I contribute my money to the cause? And I would say just find a pro-life organization, a Christian pro-life organization that you want to invest in and literally invest in them with your resources. And then your time and your talent, find ways that you can volunteer with them. And so I think Alternatives is one of the best places to start. Crisis pregnancy centers, they're amazing. And so I've been to a number of crisis pregnancy centers around the country and Alternatives, in my opinion, is the best one that I've visited. And then we have people who come into Denver and they do pro-life work and they meet people at alternatives. They've toured around alternatives and I've heard numerous people say this. They say, this is the best crisis pregnancy center I've ever been to. And so if you really want to get involved in an amazing way, you could do that by assisting Alternatives Pregnancy Center through your financial resources, but also through your time and your talent through volunteering. And like Linda said, they've got plenty of opportunities for the ways, plenty of different ways that you can get involved as a volunteer. So that's assistance. And then I would say awareness. So just raising your awareness as a believer. So uh, this uh, environment is a great place to start, but I would continue to increase your awareness because Christians are called to give an answer for the hope that they have in Jesus Christ. But I would also say that they're called to give an answer for, uh, for the reason why they are um, advocates for the least of these. So why should you even care for the unborn? Um, so be people who are aware of the reasons why you should even be involved in this. Um, and so I brought some books, uh, some great resources, just ways to follow up. So uh, one of my absolute favorites, and it changed my life maybe 15, 16 years ago when I read it, is A Case for Life by Scott Klusendorf. And um, I think it's the second edition is coming out in a matter of months. 
uh, and it's a fantastic resource. I'd recommend it to anyone who's looking to raise their awareness. Um, and then another one, this, this one's a little bit simpler, but again, very profound by Randy Alcorn called Why Pro-Life. You could read it in a very short period of time. And these are just ways that you can increase your knowledge. And I've got other books up here as well, but they're countless organizations. And like Linda said, you can go visit alternatives, and that's a fantastic way to grow your awareness as well. So grow your awareness, become a Christian who is informed and who's informed about some of the most important questions uh, that we face as, as Christians today. And then the last one is advocacy. So be an advocate for the unborn and for women in crisis pregnancy and also men who are also involved in this as well. Um, and so you can do that in many different ways. So one of the ways you can do that is by voting. Like Christians should use their vote um, in advocating for the unborn. Um, but in my opinion, that's probably one of the least effective ways to do that. Uh, so find out other ways that you can be an advocate. So if you're raising your awareness, if you're involved somewhere in the, in, in the pro-life movement, then God's going to provide you opportunities to be an advocate with your family, with your friends, with your coworkers, and even maybe with some strangers to be able to speak up for the unborn and to defend their humanity. Because even though a lot of pro, pro-abortion advocates will say the unborn are human beings, the vast majority of people in our culture who would identify themselves as pro-abortion or pro-choice, they don't think that. They have, come, they have come up with some common narratives where they deny the humanity of the unborn. But you can be an advocate for them. And Proverbs 31 says, be a voice for the voiceless. So you have an opportunity to speak up. And because this issue is so contentious and controversial, you will have an opportunity as a believer to speak up for them. So speak up for them. Find out opportunities where you can do that. Uh, And then I would say the last thing in regards to advocacy is to be a person of prayer. Now as Christians, you are told that the most powerful thing that you could possibly do in this life is to pray. (laughs) Uh, Jesus in John 15, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, And then he attaches that statement to prayer. And so you, believer, can have an impact in this world through your prayers. Um, And so there's incredible organizations that you can be a part of to pray for the unborn. Uh, One of them is uh, one of the organizations they're going on right now called 40 Days for Life. And they meet outside of abortion clinics and Planned Parenthoods, and they just simply pray. That's all they do. They pray. And they started about 10 years ago, and over 140 abortion clinics have closed down out of the uh, abortion clinics that they've prayed outside of. 242 um, abortion workers have quit their jobs and have been able to um, leave the abortion industry through, through their advocacy, through their advocacy work. And then 22,000 known cases of children being saved outside of abortion clinics through the ministry of these people who are just simply praying. 22,000 children saved. So um, that's an incredible ministry that you can be a part of. There are other prayer organizations around that focus on pro-life work. So those are just some simple ways that I would encourage you to get involved in in pro-life work. And then in addition to that, just the last thing I would say is that if you have an abortion in your past, whether you are a man or a woman, um, the gospel of Jesus Christ is so powerful. And he covers over all sins. And he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he takes what Um, He takes what is dark in our life and then he transforms it into light and he says, I make a promise to you that whatever evil has been done to you or what evil you have done, if you are in Jesus Christ and I use that for the sake of your good and for my glory. And so so if that is uh, part of your story, I would encourage you to use that in order to be an advocate for the unborn and for women who are facing crisis pregnancy. Um, and, and the gospel is one of the greatest opportunities that we have in the issue of abortion because if we have something like 73 million abortions taking place every single year worldwide, then that means that we have no greater opportunity in the church 
um, because then we can speak truth in love. We can speak the gospel to those hurting men and to those hurting women and let them know that Jesus Christ covers over all sins. And so, anyway, d- don't shy away from from speaking up and preaching the gospel and advocating for the unborn. Hey, thank, uh, thank you, each of you, for sharing some of your heart and your passion around this issue. What I'd like for us to do right now is uh, I'd like for us to actually just turn to your neighbor and, and quietly, I'm not going to have a microphone, just turn to your neighbor, uh, maybe someone you came with, even if you didn't, and simply ask this question, uh, what one thing that a panelist just mentioned struck your interest? Like, what's one thing that you heard tonight, even just a little quick 10-minute snippet, that you'd be like, huh, I wonder what the implications are of that, or what sort of, maybe something that you, that struck you the wrong way, or, or that you, you would want to ask further on that. So I, I want you to kind of just, let's kind of prime the pump a little bit, but just together as a, as a group. So I'm going to give us about 10 minutes. You guys just turn to your neighbor. What's one thing that sort of struck you? your attention most, got your attention most with what the panelists said, and then I'll bring us into a Q and, time of Q&A. Okay, guys. We're going to now enter to a time of open Q&A. Hopefully you've had a chance to maybe crystallize some thoughts that you have rolling around in your mind. And, um, and so we'll give you a chance to ask questions to our panelists. Again, guys, thanks so much uh, for being here. And uh, I have a mic uh, for you guys. I just noticed that the battery light is flashing. So we're going to use this mic as long as it will last. And then we'll just have to uh, repeat the question, the panelists, as you hear the question, once the mic goes, just repeat it so that we have it for the recording. That's okay. All right. So uh, who would like to uh, get our discussion going by asking the first question? I know you have them. All right, go for it. How would you navigate? Um, uh, whoever, whosoever wishes to to jump in on this, uh, how would you navigate um, encounters with humans who jump to "I am pro life" or "I am pro choice" and do not cross go, do not collect two hundred dollars, do not seek to negotiate with me? There is no middle ground here. Uh, I'm dying on this hill. I mean, the the first place to start in any conversation is asking more questions, uh, trying to understand why. Often, I feel like the more anger you experience in this conversation, there's probably a bigger story, and it's worth digging into and hearing them out and understanding. Um, I know with with uh, especially like the overturn of Roe v. Wade, some people, you know, were really, really freaking out because their own stories, they didn't have any imagination for how they could have done anything else other than abortion. And so, um, yeah, so asking questions, trying to understand the story, because then you can actually have compassion for the reality of what was hard in their stories um, and provide, hopefully, you know, um, a, a nuanced approach of, Okay, well, you know, this this was the huge thing in your life that you couldn't overcome. Well, pregnancy centers actually will walk alongside women who are experiencing homelessness or abuse and whatever um, that story may be. Because I think a lot of people just don't know of the resources and they, you know, and they didn't experience that. Um, so I think that's a helpful way to start. But any other? Thank you. So do you really think the people that are so angry about it have had an experience with abortion themselves? Not everyone, no. But I've, I've seen that as a trend, just personally, but not, I don't okay. assume that every single person has. You know, I'm not going to read that. I always assume story. that they have no experience whatsoever, and they're just going off of emotion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, uh, when, when somebody is almost like irrationally angry um, on this particular topic. In some ways, I almost assume that there is uh, there is some kind of experience with abortion in their past. And maybe that's, you know, I I drove my friend to the abortion clinic and it was a horrible experience. Not not necessarily them, they themselves. 
have experienced an abortion. Um, because the numbers now in the United States are um, over uh, 20% of um, pregnancies end in, abor in, end in abortion. So we're talking one-fifth of all pregnancies, more than one-fifth of all pregnancies. And so by the, by the time uh, a woman reaches the age of 44, uh, one-fourth of all women have had an abortion in their past. And so by implication, that means one-fourth of all men have abortion in their past. I mean, they may not know it, but um, so those numbers are are huge. They're significant. And so if you think about that in terms of the church, and we look at the statistics between inside and outside the church in regards to a, somebody having abortion in their past, it's fairly insignificant in terms of the, the differences. There is some gap, but it's not, not huge. Um, so that means that one-fourth of all people in the pews on Sundays have abortion in their past, um, which means that when somebody's getting angry that maybe, maybe that is, I mean, statistical, uh, not likelihood, but there's, there's a good chance that maybe they do have abortion in their past, and maybe that is why they're responding. So that's why we talk about compassion a lot, and that's why I love to emphasize the gospel of grace, um, because that's what people need to hear in order to overcome the guilt and the shame of abortion in their past. I, I think what we saw, especially pretty quickly after the Roe decision, was just this fear of reproductive rights. Like, whenever you talk about taking somebody's rights away, you know, and, and I think for women especially, because, sorry guys, because I think that women's rights have been um, maybe intruded upon, if that's the word I can use. And so, yeah, it's it's something that I would just like to hear more from whoever is that angry. And there's also a point when someone is irrationally angry that you're not going to, like, it's a losing battle. And so just to ask them, like, if someone comes into one of our clinics and they're just, I need a pregnancy test so that I can, and an ultrasound so that I can go have an abortion, um, and, and we, we do that for them, and then we also ask them, how else can we care for you? So we want them to know that no matter how angry they are, no matter what they're feeling, we are going to care for them if they will allow us to. And that enters into a space of relationship, which then takes down barriers. So that's kind of our approach. Yeah. Hey there. I have two questions. One for you first. Um, I think, is your ministry or organization primarily Christian staff members? We are faith-based, yes. Faith-based, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you know if there are any other voices in the game, so to say, that are pro-life that are not Christian and kind of what their motivation would be for that. I mean, we obviously have the Imago Day that is our motivation, um, but this tends to be very, you know, it turns in, oh, the Christians are blah 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 I'm just curious if there are other voices that you're aware of in the conversation that are pro-life that are not faith-based. Yeah, it's a great question and one that I love because we've even been on this conversation of how do we invite people into volunteerism who, yeah, who are not sharing our, our the same faith values and what does that look like because they still have a heart for life. And if we're going to move the needle on caring for the unborn, it's going to take all of us. Like it can't just be Alternatives Pregnancy Center in the city of Denver, right? Like there's, it has to be a collective. So it's a great question, but like Feminists for Life, um, huge organization nationwide. Uh, you can follow them on social media and uh, very pro-life and doing some great work and they are not faith-based and that's the one that comes to my mind uh, right off the bat. There's a Democrats for Life um, that is very ecumenical um, and they're, they're more, obviously more politically based, but um, yeah, they're, they're out there. Just one other resource um, is called The Matter of Life. It's the documentary that came out last year or the year before, and it showcases the whole spectrum. Uh, and, and it's really, really great. It's extremely holistic. It goes into the whole history of uh, abortion and uh, Mary Sa Margaret Sanger and all of that, and then it comes up right to the present moment. And um, so that's a really helpful resource to kind of wrap your mind around the whole story. The matter of life. The matter of life, yep. I have one other question. Blake. 
Um, you seem very like in the statistics of things. I heard, and I might art- not articulate this well, I heard a recent factoid about a population crisis in the sense of we don't have enough people being born to sustain, I don't know if we're going to say economy or the world as we know it, and your facts about the death rate, I guess is what we'll call the 55 million, and then 73 abortions. I'm curious if that's something you factored in and like your thoughts in that picture. Yeah, the uh, world population um, question has kind of been at the center of the debate for, for, for decades, actually for a long time, going back to the 1600s with certain philosophers that said, we're too overpopulated and, and it's going to be a disaster. Um, and this was back, like back in the 1600s, a guy named uh, uh, Bishop Malthusius, and, and um, uh, now we call it Malthusian ethics, which, which talks about population control. Um, and th- we weren't even beyond a billion at that point. So uh, um, there are people who will say we need abortion in order to decrease the, popula- the human population in order to maintain our standard of, of life and living, um, whereas the pro-life side would say, no, 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 it's actually the opposite. We're, we, we actually need to maintain a certain level of growth in order to, um, in order to uh, help to maintain certain uh, aspects of the way that we live. And so we're seeing that in places, especially in the East, the former Soviet Union, where they have negative population growth. Like, for instance, in Russia, for instance, they actually abort more babies than are born. And so their population is decreasing by hundreds of thousands every, every single year. And this is like, this is something they're aware of, and they're being terrified um, of, of the consequences of that that will take place over the next several decades. Places like China actually reversed their one-child policy because they realized, like, we shouldn't be doing this, at least to the, to the level that we are, um, because the, uh, the negative impacts of not having enough human beings is far worse than having more human beings. Um, and so that's why you, you have seen in recent years the reversal of the one-child policy. Which is a which is a horrendous policy. So anyway, this is this is something that definitely uh, people is in places where uh, populations are declining at a steady rate. They're talking about it right now. So, and, and anyway, I think doomsdayers on either side get it wrong. Um, so I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, and as Christians, we believe that we are called to be fruitful, multiply. And I still think that that command actually applies to us today. Um, and I think that the greatest resource that the world has is are the human resources. And we all have always found ways to make life better and not worse in terms of advancing technology and things like that. Thank you. Amy, did you have a... Yeah. Um, I guess one of the questions I have is that like when you look at at our society like the thing that's that will maybe move the needle is it's not a law right it's it's a heart change and 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 especially when Dave kind of laid out for us the past couple weeks about the history of of society and church's views on this like I mean the the early protection of life wasn't about the baby or the mother, it was about the father and him being denied wealth, essentially. And so, and, and there's things that carry over, like women feel that, like, you know, not, not having the same rights in some ways, but like knowing that what this is happening in this context and that a law is not going to change people's hearts or thinking on this issue, like, how do you move that, that, that heart needle? I'm sure that's an easy answer. Yeah. Well, first of all, you could come and write copy for us because what you're talking about is something that we've been writing in our in our blogs and things because the... <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, because you're exactly right. Uh, you can't legislate people's hearts. So there's a, that's why I started out with talking about the spectrum of pro-life because there is a place for the political, but it's not where you're going to find alternatives. And so we talk about the value of one. And we talk about the value of her, the value of him, and the value of the preborn. But if they don't feel first that we value them, we don't even really have a chance to value the preborn, right? So we have to meet them where they're at in the complexity of their circumstances.
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a sweeping change short of, I love what, what Blake said, the prayer part of it, because it's the Lord removing the scales from people's eyes and saying that the preborn has no value or that women have no value. Um, I watched a great podcast on that, by the way, Women and Their Value. But, um, yeah, it, it, it really does, it seems daunting, but I would encourage us all not to give up and not to give in to the narrative that we can't make a difference. Because when I look back on 40 years of alternatives and I think of 100,000 people served and our communities look differently, and now the people that we served in 1982, their babies have babies, and it's impactful. So we can make a difference if we, if we keep at it. And the value of if you look around this room and say 25% of us wouldn't be here if we use this statistic that Blake was talking about, yikes, you know, that's because we all have value here sitting in this room and we all bring great things to our community. So it, it does seem daunting, but please don't give up. Please hang in there. Please pray for us that are on the front lines. Uh, hi, this is kind of a spicier question, so, um, but I'm sure we can all handle it. Um, so I have like studied kind of, well, been in various situations where um, I've like learned about and I guess th this topic. And um, one of the things that was clear was like, you know, there's been this de precipitous decline in abortion over the past couple of decades, except for in 2020 when it rose again for the first time. And that was largely attributed to an increase in kind of comprehensive sexual education and contraception. And I'm curious what your all, all of your perspective is on kind of Christian's role in advocating or not advocating for those things um, and kind of how we how we should think about, you know, decreasing abortion in the context of decreasing pregnancy or not, if that makes sense. Well, f for us, it doesn't look like anybody's jumping for the microphone. So, uh, <laughs> so for us, um, we, the prevention side of what we're doing is on the education at the, at the student level. Um, and even we did a pilot for middle school girls and their mothers. Well, actually, there was one dad and daughter that joined us. And so creating the space for conversations for parents to have with their kids about uh, just healthy decision making in general and leading to what does a healthy relationship look like and what does healthy sexuality look like. Um, on the pregnancy center side, we offer our nurse uh, manager is certified in FEM, which is FEDA is, um, oh, shoot. Oh, I'm going to forget it. Fertility, education, medical management. Um, and so it's, it's like a form of natural family planning. And, um, and so we offer that for free, and it's educational. Um, and so, yes, the idea is to help people understand their value so they're making choices that are going to lead to their best health outcomes. And um, what I hope we're not headed towards, but it feels to me like we are, and this is probably an audacious statement, is that we're just using abortion as birth control. And that, that feels really unfortunate to me. So I don't know. That, that's that alternatives anyway. Yeah, this was an area that I uh, looked into. Um, I, to be honest, I was c quite skeptical of some of the Catholic um, claims about uh, contraception and its connection to abortion. Like so, in in Catholic theology, they will they will say and abortion go hand in hand. And I thought ah, that's like a pretty extreme claim. Uh, but the more I looked into it, I, I thought, yeah, I think there's actually more. Uh, I, th I think there's more truth to that statement than not because. What we had seen would happen um, statistically with contraception and abortion is that they grew in proportion with one another, at least in the United States. So I don't know outside the United States. I don't know how that played out. But in the wake of the sexual revolution and the availability of uh, contraceptive pills, um, we saw an increase in, in abortion because there was actually an increase in unplanned pregnancies because more people were having sex outside of marriage and more people were having unplanned pregnancies, even with the use of contraceptions. Uh, contraceptives, um, because th their their failure rate is is actually a, a lot larger than I thought that they were. So when I was looking at this, wow, that's that's astounding. Um, and so right now, 
I think worldwide there's something like 120 million unplanned pregnancies every year worldwide. And the vast majority of those end in abortion. And most of those people were using contraceptives the month that they got pregnant. So, um, so studies show that they're, they're not using them properly necessarily, but a lot of them were thinking that they were using them properly. And so, uh, at least in my mind, I am not a huge advocate for mass um, uh, contraceptive use because of that, because I do think that abortion has become kind of this backup plan when contraceptives fail. Um, so hopefully that, that makes sense. And if you wanted to ask more questions later in regards to like how, how those are more connected, at least in my mind, I'd love, love to talk more about it. Um, Blake, I'd, I'd really like to hear from you and, and obviously if, if anyone else has any other thoughts, but, um, Something that I, I personally found found tough is that I look at this issue through through the lens of the gospel and through the lens of of a godly view of of the unborn and of children, just people, right? Um, but someone who doesn't have a lens of the gospel, to me, um, it can make more sense. Like I see how you get here, and because you don't have a value of people as a whole, your value is of the self. Um, particularly in our culture, I, th- I believe that that is quite a strong message, is that you do what is best for you, and you have to protect yourself. And um, that does seem to be a little bit of the cry, right? Like, well, it's my body, and you can't tell me what to do with it. And, and I can see how they get there. So my question is, how do you hold this very black and white view of the gospel, which is, Aborting babies is wrong, but how do we also confront someone and give them compassion and grace? Like, how do we confront this issue when not, I think maybe Amy was asking that a little bit also, but I would just love to hear from you. What is your kind of view of how do we approach this through an understanding of you're not coming at this in the same sort of lens if that may am I making sense it totally there? totally makes sense and this is what we would call natural theology or some, some people would say common grace there's still some common grace that I think is available to, even to the unbeliever especially in regards to issues of uh, who's human um, the value of human life um, what is um, the taking of innocent life uh, the the blessing of procreation like all these things like I think that even even non-christians can can understand those things. But for me as a pastor and as, as a Christian, the gospel takes precedence. And I, th- and I know that people will not, their, their eyes are blinded to the truth of, of the gospel and they're blinded to, the, to, to many, many different truths. And so for me, that's why my heart's cry until my dying breath will always be Jesus Christ and the gospel that saves. And so for us, I think that needs to be the primary word. Um, and yet at the same time, we're called to advocate for the vulnerable, even if other people refuse to recognize the humanity of others. And we see tremendous success throughout Christian history of Christians doing this. I know that you guys talked about this the first week. Christians were, were literally taking children off of the trash heaps uh, to save them. Um, some of the greatest pro-life stories ever are early on in, in Christian history, like Basil of Caesarea running abortionists out of his town. Um, he didn't he didn't care what their worldview was. He was like, this is the truth, and like we need to defend these children. Um, you see William Wilberforce in, in the cause of, of life regarding slavery, and in many ways, he understood that there would be plenty of people who did not uh, share the same Christian worldview that he did, but that did not deter him from preaching the truth about the humanity of, of slaves and, and black people and other people. Um, and so I think for us, we can recognize that there's common grace, speak truth and love, and then recognize that God will work in the hearts of people, even unbelievers, to recognize these truths and to follow in changing things like laws and changing hearts and minds, even if maybe they don't uh, receive Christ in the end. Um, and just even me, anecdotally, personally, I've had more success in 
converting people, for lack of a better term, from a pro-choice perspective to a pro-life perspective than I have converting people to Jesus. And so I'm like, gosh, this is so weird. Like, shouldn't it be the other way around? But um, so I'd say that there is hope and there is common grace available even to unbelievers and we should advocate for the unborn and speak truth and in hopes that people will recognize the truth when they see it. Great. Um, this question is for the panel. Um, maybe with special interest for you, Linda, uh, based on your comment about pro-life and that movement being on a spectrum, and maybe for you, Blake, as well. But I think what we learned last week and what's kind of been established is that the unborn, they bear the image of God. They're people just like you and we are. Okay, And so part of the confusion on my part as someone who's wanting to advocate is understanding um, when we advocate, part of the advocacy comes in the form of advocating for just laws, laws that glorify God and his justice and his kindness and the way that he looks after his people and his creation. Um, so if the panel would just kind of talk about how you contemplate the resistance within the pro-life movement to the holding accountable of all parties, including the mother and the father, involved with the murder of unborn children. Well, it's a big question. Um, I guess off the top of my head, what's coming to my mind is I'm glad I don't have to be the judge of that and that I'm going to let Jesus be the judge of that in the end. What he's called me to is a compassionate response to women who are experiencing an unplanned pregnancy and um, helping them see their own value first and that they are image bearers of God. And that after that, how can we care for them in this unplanned pregnancy? And, and are there resources and support that we can offer them where they do not have to choose between the life of their child and what they consider their education or their career or whatever that might look like? And in that process, we are demonstrating the love of Jesus to them. And there are many times that we, because we're trained in asking good questions, there, we can ask a question about how their faith informs their decision. And if uh, they are open and willing, because we work on permission-based care, we will speak about our faith and, and their faith, and we hear about their faith. And many times that can lead to a conversation about, you know, even if it's, well, God must hate me because otherwise why would I be in the situation? And we can unpack that with them. So I know it's not exactly answering your questions, but it's, it's what we've been called to in the accountability of, of truth and love, being true to who we are as faith, as, as followers of Jesus, and yet also having this common grace. I love that, that uh, phrase for someone because at the end of the day I'm I'm not going to raise their child I'm not going to live with their adoption plan I'm not going to live with their uh, the after effects of an abortion if there are um, but what I am going to live with is did I do what Jesus called me to do today with them in relationship and offer them uh, hope and So it's really easy to get really fired up about the injustice of, of abortion. Um, but this is just like a, an approach shift. But in Luke 15, the religious people come to Jesus and kind of reprimand him for hanging out with sinners. And they have a sneer, you know, like, how do you be around sinners? And he proceeds to tell three stories about that which was lost. And I think that's how we can reframe this conversation of he tells the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost sons. And that, I think, is so critical. Like, we can say, like, how can you be, you know, like, how can this be? There's, there should be justice. And yet Jesus kind of flips it on his head and said, like, they're lost. And our job as the church is to go and be that expression of Christ's love, to go and seek and save that which is lost, to have that heart of compassion um, and welcome them home because they, they are spent. They're, you know, fragile individuals, the men and the women involved in these stories, the abortion clinic workers um, are, are probably thinking that they're doing the best that they can, and yet they're lost, and we have the opportunity to to invite them into a grander story and hope and healing that they, they don't currently have. Yeah, um, this is something I've wrestled with personally in the past and I, um, and I think I've come to a fairly satisfying uh, conclusion from a historical perspective. 
when we look at uh, places like, um, uh, when, we, when we look at things like uh, the slave trade, slavery, when we look, things, uh, look at things like uh, uh, the wake of justice, or uh, justice in the wake of the Holocaust and the end of World War II, is that not everybody was brought to the kind of justice that they deserved, um, and in part, it was just it would have been almost virtually impossible to do that because of the numbers, but then also because people recognized from a societal standpoint that pardon was was uh, pardon and grace was the best way forward in terms of providing healing and then a greater form of justice um, moving forward, and so I think in that regard, we, should we advocate for laws? that uh, penalize people for getting abortion, seeking abortion, and especially abortionists? I would say eventually, yes, I think we should get there. But um, as we make our way there, I think we can take uh, a lesson from these, from these historical movements um, where people were able to uh, give pardon and give grace in order to cover over a multitude of sins that provided stability moving forward for generations to come. So hopefully that, that helps to maybe answer the question. Yes, yeah, so I have a question for Becky uh, because I have very, very briefly been involved in some legal efforts to address the foster care system in Colorado. And, and you mentioned very briefly just how messed up it is and, and what, a, what a really rough uh, system it is. And so in, in, in light of this conversation, I'd be curious to, to hear your kind of perspective on, you know, as Christians seeking to make abortion not feel like the only option for a lot of mothers who have unplanned pregnancies, whose maybe existing children are at risk of ending up in foster care. Um, should our goal be, and is there a path to you know, improve the foster care system, or should we be you know, focusing on efforts like what you're doing with Safe Families um, to, to kind of provide an alternative infrastructure mm -hmm. for supporting these at-risk families? Okay, we're going to be here all night because um, <laughs> I've got lots of thoughts and feelings. Um, but one of my thoughts is that recently there was a federal law passed, Kelsey's like, I know, um, called Family First Law, which funnels a lot of the funding from DCF away from foster homes and especially residential homes into trying to support the biological family, which in a lot of ways sounds really wonderful, but there are not enough providers of anything. There's not enough addiction specialists, enough, how, like, it's just not in my, in from what I can see and from the people that work in the system, um, they're like, this is not actually real life. Um, but so because of that, there are kids staying in situations that would make many of us really uncomfortable. And I think it's just such a huge opportunity that we have as the big American church to step in and love kids and love families. Um, I do know foster, like th parents I've met through foster care, um, the bio parents that like they want to love their kids, but there's just, they're dealing with so, so much. Um, and I think there's always going to be a need for that. But if we can especially reach families who have not quite gotten to that point, who maybe are aware that they are addicted to drugs and if they can have some safe place for their child, they can retain custody and still go to drug treatment and maybe make a better life for them and their child and whoever else might be coming along. Um, and I think we just, it's just that it involves relationship and it's not like a quick, easy, one and done thing. Um, but I think if the church stepped into that role in a big way, like it would just change all of society. And um, we would be like the early church in Acts, right? And like literally like loving our neighbor in a daily, every day, like this is what we do and this is sacrificial and my kids have to share their toys because this is how we love these kids and they can understand that. Um, and that's different than going and doing something like once every couple months or, um, 
I don't know, just doing it on more of a surface. Once people are in your home and you're really loving them, I think it can change a lot of lives. Also, the foster care system seems really hard to change. <laughs> so, I don't know, does that answer? Uh, first of all, thank you for to each of you for sharing your time and your expertise this evening. Um, my question harkens back to something Dave mentioned at the beginning, which is that in his experience, most people who are struggling with whether or not to decide, most women who are considering an abortion, are philosophically committed to the pro-life position, but they lack the practical supports. And I think, Becky, you mentioned like relational poverty. I think that was the phrase you used. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions. One is, would you add anything to that list, that kind of broad list of practical, relational, economic, emotional, mental, physical health supports um, that you feel like often push mothers towards feeling like abortion is their only viable option? And then the second question is, then what would be just one very practical thing, if you had to choose one practical thing for us all to take away from tonight to do to help support women in those situations or families in those situations, what would it be? Oh, because I have the microphone. Um, I think the one practical thing is to go to safefamilies.org and sign up, a volunteer, or just talk to me. Um, but be figure out a way to be involved in people that need a friend and need support. Um, and I think the only other thing off the top of my head is not only relationships with partners, but relationships with existing children. There's a, I mean, I have a lot of kids and sometimes it's overwhelming and um, I can see how if I didn't have a support system and I had an unplanned pregnancy, how it would affect my children is huge. Um, and I think that like just navigating all that, like all the, all the relationships is a really big part of it. Uh, there is a long list of things that drive abortion, and um, as I mentioned in, in earlier, that that every woman's circumstances are so unique, so it's kind of hard to prescribe, oh, this will fix it, right? Um, so the takeaway is, much like, <laughs> it, it's come to, uh, come and tour one of our clinics, because then we can talk more in depth um, about about the, the drivers of abortion and what we are trying to do to solve those support issues uh, with our mama mentoring. Uh, so that starts from the time she decides to carry her pregnancy to term. We offer that to her, it's free. Uh, she's matched with a mentor. They work with her through the birth and up to one year. And if she needs more after that, we, as we assign a case manager to her and help her get connected in other things that she needs. We have the same thing for fathers so so that they can actually be co if they're co parenting or married you know we have a lot of married women that come in and and yeah they, they don't want to have another baby so um so we try and do that through the mentoring process and offering those supports but if you come and take a tour then you could learn more in depth what we're doing what the volunteer opportunities are i would say for fellowship denver there's an organization called i, I think the website might be different than this but it's called the care portal and we use the care portal so it's a network of churches in the denver area that um, they have a liaison that's signed to the, assigned to the care portal, and we put our requests out there. So let's say that a woman needs um, $250 to fix her car, and um, we put the request out there because she can't get to work if she doesn't have a car, and then that need gets met, and the care portal pays it right to the provider, so it's not one of these deals where you're giving somebody money and you don't know where it's going. But we've used it quite a bit, and uh, it's been really helpful. It's a very practical, tangible way for resources. Um, and so, but yeah, come and tour one of our clinics. I'd love to get, know, get to know you. All right, guys. Uh, Natasha? Go ahead. Yeah. 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 I, I agree with everything that they said. Um, and, and I think if you ever have the chance to actually talk with someone who's in this situation, like I said before, just asking questions before speaking, you know, because that opens up and unlocks so many doors of conversations to know where people are coming from. And then go tour the pregnancy center, and then you'll have even more information to share that will probably dismantle a lot of their arguments that they might be feeling. All right, this is great. Um, we're, we're past time, so I just want to honor your time. Panelists, thank you so much. Let's give them a hand. We...
Uh, we really do appreciate your presence. Uh, I'm going to close us now. I'm sure if you st have, still have a burning question, I mean, they're kind of trapped in here. So you can still get your, your question addressed, I'm sure. Uh, but I'm going to go and dismiss us so you guys can, uh, we can officially be, uh, be uh, dismissed. So let's pray. God, thanks for today. Uh, thanks for these panelists and how you've led each of them to, uh, to give us tonight really profound insight in how we care for and protect the Imago Dei. Uh, thank you for their courage, sacrifice, for their intelligence, and for their dedication to educate uh, the church in how to help women who are, are facing really difficult circumstances. And uh, thank you for helping us. Uh, thank you for giving uh, this panel to us tonight to, to then equip us to support and protect the lives of the unborn as well. And uh, even as I, I think of, of all of the, the babies and the, the children that are now in this world because of the work of, of people in this room, uh, what a joy it is to know that's the case. And we pray for more and more. God, I pray for us as a church that we would be the kind of place that um, women who, who find themselves with an unplanned pregnancy, that they know they could, they, that this church would be a welcoming and a, an incredibly helpful resource that would assist them and help them and empower them and equip them uh, to, to have a child and to help uh, raise that child. So, Lord, may we be the kind of, of people and may this community be, uh, be compassionate enough and sacrificial enough uh, to, uh, to really make meaningful impacts uh, so that life is actually preserved and kept and we can see it flourish. So, um, Lord, we thank you for this evening. I thank you for every person here. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.